Hello and welcome to the Sibsey West Midlands Region vlog and podcast. My name is Josh Brownlee and I'm joined today by Hannah Kissick from CPW. Welcome. Thank you for having me. No problem, thank you. Um, Hannah is an Associate Sustainable Innovations Consultant at CPW, an international mechanical and electrical and sustainability consultancy where she runs the innovations team. Hannah has been with CPW for over 10 years, with her most recent projects including the decarbonisation of estates, such as the University of Oxford, West Midlands Police and the University of Warwick. As part of her role, she researches sorry, how our engineers can better incorporate sustainability into their designs, providing design advice on the circular economy, energy reduction and net zero carbon buildings. With a real passion for all things sustainability, Hannah is a thought leader in her field, delivering training and research, design sessions, both intern internally and to clients and industry professionals. It's quite an introduction. I know. <laughs> I think Heather, our marketing manager, has done a very good job there, but it's all true. So. <laughs> well, based on uh, your role and involvement, then yeah. Uh, yeah, so what does all that mean? What um, so uh, we'll go back to the start. So I started at CPW, um, yeah, ten over ten years now, um, and I started in the Briam team. So I started as a Briam assessor, um, and then it just gradually expanded into everything sustainability. So I became a SAP assessor, uh, doing the EPCs for domestics. Um, we looked at embodied carbon. So myself and uh, one of my colleagues, Jayesh, back in I think it was twenty sixteen. Now we went over to IES in Dublin and we did the training there on how to use the embodied carbon software because he knew IES and I knew embodied carbon. <laughs> so we went over there um, and then that ex just expanded into basically anything sustainability came kind of my way. Um, and so we ended up, what we wanted to do was make our engineers, uh, well, I say make them more sustainable. Kind of, they were doing a lot of sustainability stuff anyway, so things like passive design, some of that they were incorporating. So we wanted to share that as a company and kind of expand on that and just celebrate what we do and shout out about it a bit more. So with the part of the rebrand that we did a couple of years ago, um, that was part of it, just to show that we are sustainable engineers. Um, and then to make sure that we stayed sustainable engineers and stayed at the kind of the leading edge of technology, I'd say, we ended up with the um, with this innovations team. So it started two years ago now. Um, and it's myself and uh, my director, Neil Foster, kind of started it. And then we've got uh, a small team of uh, mechanical and electrical engineers now. And we just have various projects that, that we do so it could be um kind of a new thing to the company so decarbonization was one that obviously is, is grown and come in as a as a big thing so we started off doing that um, helping out the the engineering team so they would do the design and they would go to site but we would be the ones like doing all the analysis and the number crunching and it was quite good you know working together on that um, another part of our role is the research, so looking at what is the next best thing, what is the upcoming thing, so hydrogen boilers for example, there's a lot of talk about that, yeah. um, where is it going, are we all going to have hydrogen boilers or are we all going to have air source heat pumps or ground source heat pumps or whatever, um, so kind of looking into that and what do we think our designs are going to be in the future. Um, and the third part is all about um, looking at different softwares to help us um, as engineers to do all our design and try and smooth things out and make things a bit more easier for the engineers to do. Excellent. So, so uh, degree qualified, masters in engineering, all those sorts of things? <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't have any engineering <laughs> degrees or okay. any qualifications at all, so I feel a bit of a fraud sometimes like, really? talking about this. Well, because I'm surrounded by engineers and then people talk to me about it and I'm going, well, I'm not technically an engineer, um, but well, I've been here 10 years, so I know a little bit now. Um, no, but I did um, I did geography as a degree um, uh, in Leeds, um, and I also did a year um, in Canada as well at McMaster University. Um, and then I stayed on at Leeds and did a master's degree in climate science. Um, so it was all about the systems and, and why, it, why it works. Um, and then I wanted to do a PhD, but uh, unfortunately I didn't get the funding. So I was kind of a bit, 
at a loss of what to do. And then my dad, who um, he works for Tilbury Douglas, I nearly said Intercept then, <laughs> he's now Tilbury Douglas. Um, he's, um, he's a, I think he's a works manager, he works on the site anyway, I'm not quite sure what he does. Um, but he um, he said, oh, there's this thing called Briam and that's all sustainability and you're all sustainability. So, you know, maybe we can do this. So he knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody here. So I came here for two weeks work experience. And yeah, as I said, that was 10 years ago now. Okay. So. <laughs> and that was work experience during the Degree or GCSE? Just or? after I'd after I'd finished my masters, okay. so they just said, "Well, let's see what this Briam thing is." Um, and they had a well-established Briam team here, so Hazel um, took me under a wing, and, and uh, Dave and Catherine just taught me how to do a Briam assessment, um, and then they just kept. Uh, just kept keeping me for well, we'll have another two weeks. We'll have another two weeks, and then eventually got got this full time contract. So. Good, excellent. Are you enjoying it? Yeah, yeah, very much. I mean, I haven't left, so <laughs> um, yeah, but I really like CBW. We're a really good company. Okay. Yeah. Good. And um, so, what does a typical day hold for you? What What did you do? Get up to yesterday? Uh, yesterday, uh, yesterday, I was uh, I was helping the bid team write a bid uh, in the morning. Um, so we have obviously a lot of sustainability questions that come in on this um, and so I was helping them uh, answer some of those questions um, and then what did I do in the afternoon I was looking at um, we've, we've got some internal presentations that we've been doing and internal training so we did some uh, last year and so I was looking at the next step of how we um, kind of keep them up to date so I was creating the presentation for that which I want to give in a couple of weeks and that's all bespoke to that project uh, you know not not coming from a library of standard answers no no that's the idea so I mean our teams work on so many different projects um, so we've got hospitals we've got schools we've got domestic properties you know so it was trying to um, trying to see what aspects we can cover in all of those projects and make sure that you know everything is sustainable um, so we um, for example, where you place windows in a room. <laughs> so um, in, a, in a hospital, obviously, you've got lots of standard regulations and you might not be able to do certain things that you would be able to do in, um, in a school, for example, or in a house, you might need bigger windows because you just like a nicer room, which obviously isn't as energy efficient. So just um, it's kind of talking about the design, how we, how we are going to help um, with those designs and make them make them sustainable <laughs> so you'll draw from your knowledge and experience of uh, other projects and um, challenge maybe your, your colleagues and the team to you know well okay so somebody's put a window there well what happens if we change the glazing on it and uh, you know make it triple glazed rather than double glazed or um, trickle ventilators or something along those lines or the proportions of the window yeah um, and just find uh, and presumably resourcing them as well yeah yeah so um, we do uh, we work a lot with the digital engineering team who do all of our IS modeling um, and our, our SAT modeling um, and so we we do a lot of early stage design and that and playing around as you say you know if if we couldn't afford say a triple glazed window there can we do uh, something else instead so that a double glazed would still work and we'd still get the same results um, or if we for some reason weren't allowed to put air source heat pumps in which um, would be our go-to what are the other alternatives and what um, what compensations are we going to have to make for that so windows aren't necessarily an M&E piece of kit no. <laughs> um, but obviously they affect the thermal losses and performance of the room which then standard houses uh, have gas boilers and uh, not not a lot of you know fans or filters, i.e. opening windows and, and trickle ventilators. Uh, how do air source heat pump pumps change that approach? Um, so obviously the government have been pushing all of these these heat pumps, um, and there's that five thousand pound fee or uh, con contribution you can get to replace your gas boiler with a heat pump. Um, but heat pumps, as we know, they're best suited to lower temperatures. So unless you've got good building fabric, then you're gonna to have to have absolutely massive radiators, <laughs> um, which if you've got a nice small house like mine, which is only like two or three meters uh, wide in your room, then you're gonna put all these radiators in it. It's just gonna take up all the space. Um, so before they did, um, before they announced this, this grant, and before they started pushing these, they did some research to find out um, what the, what, what Housed with what they would need to do to help houses um, suitable for air source heat pumps, and they reckoned that any house built after 1945 um, should be okay. Might need a bit of tweaking, but should be okay and suitable for a heat pump. Um, but I was like, well, my house was 1860, so and I know my mum's is 1930, so 
you know, how many houses are before 1945? And it turns out there's a third. So a third of the UK's houses are, are not suitable for, for heat pumps, according to their own research. Um, so I don't know whether hydrogen is going to be the answer for those. So they're, they're going to start putting hydrogen into the mix in 2025. Into the gas? Into the natural gas okay. mix um, in 2025. Um, and that's good in that hydrogen, when you burn it, doesn't release CO2 like, like natural gas. But we need to be able to make the hydrogen or source the hydrogen cleanly. Um, so there's, there's, I don't know how much you know about the, the, the sourcing of hydrogen. We can do it through, um, through electrolysis, which is splitting water. So we take electricity and if the electricity we use to do that is green, if it's coming from renewables, then great, there's no CO2 at all. Um, but if we're doing it through steam methane reform, which is where you take natural gas and mix it with water, then the byproduct of that is CO2. And so we have to capture that and, and store it somehow. Um, so theoretically, if we capture it and store it properly, then there's no CO2 emissions. But realistically, do, do we think that's going to happen? I don't know. <laughs> Well, time will tell. But yeah. uh, so you bought the house uh, with, with it being a case study and a, a project <laughs> to make it a, 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 a renewable, you know. Uh, uh, we, we bought the house like many millennials because we could afford it. <laughs> um, but no, I'd love to. I'd love to be able to. But it's it's an end terrace Victorian property and it's got an absolutely massive gable wall. So I think it's about six metres long and then goes up high. And um, so I've looked at. And we looked at putting internal insulation in it, which we might still do, but then where you've got your um, your floor, uh, you've got to do something there, otherwise you're just going to have another thermal bridge through the floor. Um, and again, it's going to take up some of that room. Um, and so we looked at... the room smaller. Yeah, yeah. Um, Massively? Or, oh, I mean, what are we talking, a few mil or a few um, so, centimetres? So at the moment, it's just, it's, it's just think, uh, two brick, that's how... Th- than it is, so I'd have to put some insulation in it. So we're probably talking about 100 mil of insulation as a minimum. What about in the cavity? Um, there's no cavity, okay. it's just solid brick. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's a lot easier if you have a cavity. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so the other option we looked at was putting it on external, um, and we got some quotes for that, and we're like, we, we can just about afford that with our savings. Um, but then our, we've got a shared drive, and our next door neighbor wouldn't allow it because they don't want, um, they don't want that, that gap between it, it's technically shared property, so we'd have to go through. I, w- I wouldn't say they didn't want it, but we'd have to go through, you know, consultation, um, consultation to do all of that. Um, and I definitely wouldn't be able to fit my car down the alleyway anymore and put it in the garage, so <laughs> it would change things. But rather than just uh, working with the theory on a day to day basis, you're, you're actively doing yeah. it in, in your personal life yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. so yeah. we're looking at instead of getting triple glazed windows because um, we've got quite good double glazed but they're probably about 20 years old now so um, so we're looking at changing those to triple glazed and um, I've, I've got the model of my house which I've drawn and that seems to that seems to suggest it could save around 20 to 25 percent of our heating so per year yeah okay. yeah so that's quite a good drop and what about in the summer and um, we'll just keep everything open it's quite cool where it is anyway so our, our long side faces south but we've got the other house there so it blocks it so it's quite cool in the summer as okay. it is we're quite lucky there so it doesn't you know it doesn't retain the the, the, the temperature in the space um, when it eventually heats up it does um, but if we keep the front and the back door open and have a nice through flow then no, no we're okay then. good excellent <laughs> yeah. but uh, yeah uh, so um, what prompted you to get involved with the uh, CPW other than you know your, your dad and uh, various other industry colleagues um well, just the reason that I've stayed here um, is probably a better one because I didn't I didn't work in engineering before. I worked in you know I had a shop job while I was at university, but um, but this is my first job out of uni, and um, it's just a really we've got such a diverse range of products and then projects projects, um, and, but they also they just let me go off on my crazy ideas, especially in the role that I'm in now. You know I have a, a crazy idea about something and eventually we'll distill it down into something that actually works. Can you share with us what your latest or most recent one was? Um, so, uh, I don't know. <laughs> We've done a lot of stuff internally in the internal training, um, but there's something around, um, we were looking at wind turbines and I was going on, you know, there's because we don't do wind turbines in urban areas because the, the eddies are too too much and they, they won't spin round, basically. Um, so I was like, well, there's there's got to be a, a different way of doing this. and. Um, at, as I was researching it, um, we were looking at well, what if what if there was like um, wind? Could we put 
wind turbines but on the water on the downpipes and in drains and it turns out that, that they are doing that in portland already rainwater rainwater yeah um but it's not very energy efficient and um, so then i was like well there's got to be a similar the thing with that is that it was um spinning around this way rather than spinning around that way <laughs> um and there's uh, and then we found a i say we i, I found a um a company in America that is doing just that with wind turbines. So they've got vertical wind turbines. Um, it's it's similar to um, the aerodynamics of a plane wing, and so they sh they funnel the the wind in through them, and that creates um, that creates a, a vacuum, and so the air gets sucked down and then spins around. Um, and they're out in America, and they're they're going to be launching in in Europe later this year. So we got in touch with them and had a conversation with them, um, and there's a couple of projects that we might be able to use them on. So. Mm -hmm. This this crazy idea that I you know was allowed to go and research and try and find out um, has has come to something. And where did you get the inspiration from? Um, I don't know, just just being, something not just you, just yeah, as you not not yeah. to sleep, and you think right, I need to make a mental note of that for tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, or I've got lots of um, I'm signed up to so many different um, so many different subscriptions and newsletters and things. So we go to events like Future Build. Um, and you just get loads of manufacturers emailing you, um, and I'm one of the people that reads all of those emails. <laughs> um, that's my morning when I'm over breakfast. That's what I read, and then that just kind of sparks the ideas and and thinking, oh, okay, well, what about if we did this? So. Yeah, well, having a product that spins in the horizontal plane and then yeah. turning it through ninety degrees to get it spinning in the vertical plane, yeah, and maybe changing the application and you know yeah. seeing whether. You can try something, and presumably you get in some products and have a play around with them, maybe. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's the idea. So as I say, we're still very new, but there's a two or three that we've been able to, to do that. Or we've gone out, um, we've gone out to um, to sites. So there was somebody mentioned um, they were in a meeting, and somebody said, "Well, what about this deep geothermal heat?" Um, and everybody kind of looked at each other and went, "I don't know." So we went and we looked at it, and they're doing it in Cornwall. So the whole team went down to Cornwall, down to the Eden Centre, um, and we had a look um, at what they were doing. And we spoke to the engineers there, and it turns out that they've got a very specific bit of geology that means that there's some granite that is warmer than um, and closer to the surface. So they've dug down, I think it's 15 kilometres down into this granite. granite. Um, and then um, they're extracting the heat through that or pumping water around um, and extracting the heat in that. Um, but the only that's the only place in the UK where the granite is near enough to the surface. That and that's specifically that. in Cornwall. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was an idea that someone said to the team when we went and researched it and went, yeah, it's really good where it is, but unless you're specifically there and unless you have a lot of EU funding, then it's not something that, that we can take back. So not everything we look at is something that, that we can use, but the knowledge is there. So 15 kilometres deep? Uh, maybe not 15, maybe it's five kilometres. I can't remember. But in comparison to ground source heat pumps, yeah. significantly deep. Deeper. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, imagine ground source of standard 100 meters deep. Um, there's some deep borehole um, systems. Um, one in particular called Erda, which we've um, been looking at for a number of projects, and they go down 200 meters deep. Um, but they also go at an angle rather than going straight down. So that um, that area of heat transfer that you've got because it's diagonal and because it's deeper is a lot bigger. So they're a lot more efficient than your standard boreholes. Um, so there's a supermarket chain in particular that uses those and they can pump whatever they need one store they only need like two boreholes and they can fit both of those because they're going away from each other the surface is just a car parking space so they can fit two of them in the space of a car parking okay. space standard length car park not, yeah. not even a lorry or no, a van. no no just okay. a general yeah <laughs> wow. yeah so the um the oxford brooks university have got that for their um their district heating They've got that system, and um, so as part of our decarbonisation for them, we're looking at how many more buildings we can get onto that system, and what do we need to do to get those buildings on there. Mm, yeah. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. um, so, what about STEM and, and outreach activities? You, you you get out and see other professionals and projects. Uh, do, you, do you get into schools and colleges and universities? Yeah, yeah. So um, a few years ago now, um, one of our directors came to us and said, "Yeah, we'd we'd like to." We'd like some help on getting some more women into the industry. I mean, generally, we just need more engineers, but um, in particular, they were they were looking to try and get more women and could we do something? So myself and um, a couple of the other uh, ladies here, we um, we started looking into WISE, the Women in Science and Engineering, and looking into the Women's Engineering Society. Um, and so now on International Women in Engineering Day, which is June the 23rd, we often go to schools um, and just do a lot of talks and just say, you know, engineering isn't having to you know get oil on your hands or have to be on a building site or anything you can it's just problem solving all engineering is just problem solving so if you're good at that 
um, then then this could be a career for you and everything's, you know, you don't even have to be that good at drawing now because everything's online and everything's on CAD. And... But you're not averse to putting on a pair of steel toe cap boots and a high vis no. vest and a helmet <laughs> and going out on a construction site no, and seeing no, no. reality and no. the practicality sort of. No, so um, so as I say, my dad uh, is is a builder, um, and both my granddads were builders as well. So when we were kids, uh, there was always something going on. There was always some building project or an extension or something. So me and me and my brothers would always help out, just like holding out measuring tapes or whatever it was. Um, and so uh, you know, I've always been in that. And then um, when I started here, they sent me on secondment for a month um, to go onto a building site, and so I was there for a month, just you know, learning how everything works and learning what exactly does you know the cladders do something different to the to the plumbers to do something different to everything else um so i spent like a few days with the qs I spent a few days with all the various different teams on site and um, just learning how that how that worked and um, so no not averse at all <laughs> yeah it's quite impressive seeing the, the groundworks and the earthworks and digging foundations and yeah. then putting up a, a steel frame maybe and then laying the floors and then putting the walls up and putting the windows in and at that point then the m e services can potentially go in unless yeah. there's any prefabrication or whatever yeah i think it was really good experience just learning how a building gets gets put together i mean i don't mind saying when i started here i didn't actually know what m e was really you know i uh, i always thought that well an architect designs a building and then a builder builds it that's how it works and so you know i didn't realize there was structural engineers and there was you know m e engineers and then you had all the public service public health engineers and all these different people that were involved and technically build the building like actually design the building <laughs> it's them who, who do the work yeah i like to liken the architects to the facade and the exterior and the visuals and then the the structure is the the skeleton and then the ME is the sort of brain being the bms and the veins and the arteries yeah. being the pipes <laughs> and the wires that convey everything around but yeah, uh, yeah no it's uh, that there's certainly a, a wide range there for for anybody that's uh, interested in getting involved mm -hmm. um you mentioned hydrogen earlier. Yes. Can you speak a bit more about that? Um, so hydrogen, whether it's going to come into into buildings here, I don't know. <laughs> is the short answer. Uh, the, the, there's a little bit in cars at the moment. Isn't yes. It? But it's very very isolated. Yeah. So there's. Um, I think it's Toyota have had a hydrogen car, um, and then Shell had put some petrol station petrol stations for hydrogen around the place i think they're closing them down but then i read something yesterday that there's another company going to start them up i mean i think realistically it's mostly going to be for long range transport um or for like boats for example where um, where you can't have loads and loads of batteries because they're so heavy and it's just completely fuel inefficient or with the lorries you can't have them stopping every you know 100 meters or so um well, 100 miles or so because it's just inefficient um, so hydrogen, although it's not as efficient as using direct electricity, it's perfect for those scenarios where you just need that that um, that little extra push, um, where you can't put loads of batteries around. Um, so we've got some buses in Birmingham that are hydrogen. Um, there's some obviously London, Liverpool, Leeds. I think everywhere is starting to get them now. Um, those places that that they can't go and, and top up. Um, so I'd be interested to see how that works. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know whether it's going to end up in, in planes or not. I think for some reason we have an adversity to putting hydrogen in flying things. Can't think why. No, no <laughs> idea. No, but I, can't think. but um, I don't know whether that's going to go hydrogen or biofuel. There, there's more research to do. Yeah. Okay. And uh, professional institutions and organisations, are you involved with any? Um, well, I'm a member of the Energy Institute and a member of um, the Women in Engineering Institute. Um, so. I do a bit of work, as I say, with, with the women in engineering, um, engineering there. And that's <laughs> um, SIBZ and building services engineers and IET, and, um, but obviously you, you, you're in an engineering practice yes. and you're talking <laughs> with engineers and communicating with them. Yeah, yeah. so um, we yeah. do a lot of, I go to a lot of the seminars that, that SIBZ and IET do, and as I say, I sneak in under the radar and just as someone's guest or as somebody's wing. <laughs> Um, but we've got, I mean, the engineers here are really involved in SIBC, so I think Neve, um, Neve Lucky, no, she was the, the chairman or the vice chairman of the YEM Society, yeah. um, and um, we do a lot of work with them and a lot of work with, with others around there. So. Yeah, knowledge sharing, best yeah. practice. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what advice would you give to somebody that was uh, looking to, to follow in your footsteps? I don't know, just have an open mind about everything, I think, um, and just keep 
asking questions and don't afraid to be called an idiot, which is, uh, you know, something I get called quite a lot of times. Don't be stupid, you can't do that. Um, this is why I have a team of engineers around me so I can, I like think of, or one of us will think of an idea and then we'll run it past all the specialists and they'll go, no, don't be stupid. Or actually, yeah, there's something in that. So, um, yeah, just... Well, being strong enough to yeah. stick with what you think you know, might have some legs and, and be a, a new way of looking at things. Yeah, well. yeah, I think, um, I mean, my confidence has certainly grown in the 10 years. I don't know whether it's being here or whether it's just getting older in general, um, but I had proper imposter syndrome when I started and I'd never really speak up or say anything because you've got all these people above you and they've been here for years and they're older and wiser than you. Um, but that's not always the case. So um, just having that confidence to go, no, actually, I do think this is a thing and just keep going with it. Um, but then equally realising when when 20 people have told you that it's not a good idea, then it's probably not a good idea. So, um. Um, mental health wise, how do you stay positive both inside and outside the workplace? Um, so I do gardening, that's that's my uh, my kind of escape and stuff. So although we've got a very narrow garden, it's very long, so I look after that. Um, uh, but just, yeah, generally being outside, I like walking and things. So during lockdown, um, I used to walk the dog in the morning and the evening is like a commute. <laughs> so I was like, walk the dog and then come home and that's it, right, I'm starting now. And I think that, that was a good break and just keeping that break up. Fruit and veg or flowers? Fruit and veg, mostly. Okay. Well, my husband does the fruit, although I've got an apple tree and some bushes, so he doesn't really have to do much of those. Um, but I've got the veg patch. Um, and then we've also got some chickens as well. Okay. Um, so no cockles? No, no. No, no morning alarm clock? <laughs> no, we don't have that, no. Our, our chickens are very chill and they're all automated, so they'll just go and hang out um, when the door opens at light. So, yeah. Plenty of eggs? Yes, yes. Yeah, so we've got three chickens and we get three eggs a day, even now in the winter, which is a sign that they're happy, so that's good. Good. And, and um, what sort of dog? I've got a Jack Russell Terrier okay. who is incredibly smart. We've trained him to ring a bell when he wants to go out or okay. feeding and stuff. So. <laughs> Time for a walk. Yeah, yeah. Good, excellent. Um, what do you think the future holds for building services engineers? Um, that's a good question. I guess um, in the immediate future, we're going to be looking at obviously a lot of existing buildings and how we decarb those. But in the future, I guess. The biggest change is going to be the way that we work. So, you know, getting AI, obviously being in the news, getting that integrated. Um, yeah. So the issue that we have is we, we don't have a lot of data when like, because our job kind of, we finish it, we, we hand it over and then that, that's it. And we don't learn anything else. And so trying to close that performance gap. Um, and although we're putting in metered data now and we're keeping hold of, of, of the data so we can see how the buildings are actually performing. I think AI is going to really help in, in collating that data and the bits that we have and working out more how our buildings are actually actually working. Have you ever played with any chat GPT or anything like that? Yeah, I play with chat GPT but it just it's more like predictive text. It was you know when we first got our phones with predictive text we used to send each other sentences by just clicking the next recommendation and it doesn't seem that different to that to me but then maybe maybe that's me, I don't know. All good fun. Uh, so, thank you very much for joining us today and sharing what you have. Um, where can people discover more about you? Um, so, I'm on LinkedIn. I think I'm one of the only Hannah Kizik's on there. Definitely the only one in the UK. Um, or you can go on our website, cpwp.com, and um, find out more about us there. Okay, yeah. well, contact details will be in the, the, the description and, yes. and the yeah. links. Um, excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining us and sharing with us what you have today. Uh, if anybody watching or listening would like to share their thoughts with us, please don't hesitate to do so. Also, if you'd like to feature in a future episode or know of or can think of somebody that you'd like to find out more about or is an inspiration to you, please get in touch. Please like, comment and share and we look forward to the next episode of the City West Midlands Region blog and podcast. Hannah, thank you very much. Thank you.